This is Kathy Bush and welcome to our Dandelion Medical Webinar titled Neonatal Abstinence Syndrome, Rethinking Our Approach. Our faculty presenter this morning is Dr. Adam Berkwit. Dr. Berkwit is a pediatric hospitalist at the York Street campus of Yale New Haven Children's Hospital. He's an assistant professor of pediatrics at the Yale School of Medicine, the assistant program director for the Yale Residency Program, the director for the Clinical Pathways Program, and currently serves as the medical director of the Pediatric Short Stay Unit. He graduated from the University of Connecticut School of Medicine and completed his internship and residency in pediatrics at Yale New Haven Children's Hospital, where he is now, or later served as the pediatric chief resident. Dr. Berkwit was the winner of the 2016 Children's Hospital Association Quality Award for his work on what we're gonna be hearing in this webinar, the baby-centered approach to NAS. Dr. Berkowitz's areas of interest include family-centered care, medical education, and quality improvement research and products. We are so thrilled to have you, Dr. Berkwick, and welcome, and take it away. Great, thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here on my first ever webinar experience and share some of the work we've been doing, like you said, in rethinking our approach to the care of infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome, or NAS. So getting started, Will I get started? It's not advancing. There we go. Um, I have uh, no conflicts of interest to disclose here. Um, all of the media files, the pictures and the videos that you see are gonna be sourced from good old Dr. Google. And I will put a shout out to my small dog, Bitsy Growler, who is currently in the audience from home. And I hope she doesn't make any noise, but if she does, it will be short lived. Um, so I wanted to start out this afternoon or morning, wherever you are, um, just by quickly reviewing what we think of as the traditional model of care that's really been in place for decades in the management of neonatal abstinence syndrome. And when I started my residency in 2007, this is what the care of these infants look like. So I apologize if this uh, sounds familiar, it probably will, I'm gonna try to get through this as quickly as I can. But infants born to mothers uh, on opioid therapy from the delivery room would be taken directly to the NICU. And once in the NICU, they'd be placed in an isolate like we see here, and inevitably they would start showing us the signs and symptoms that we're all used to of NAS, the hypertonicity, the tremors, the exaggerated moro, and all of these signs and symptoms would be cataloged and assessed using the Finnegan. Every institution has its own magical protocol in place. I think we were employing what's thought of as a relatively common uh, protocol where for three scores above eight or two scores above 12, we would start medications. And the goal under this traditional model of care was to suppress all the signs and symptoms as much as possible. So the medications would be increased and go up and up and up till all those scores were well below eight. And then once the patient stabilized at that current dose, we would begin that long weaning process that we're all familiar with. So we were doing about 10 to 20% every day to every other day. And then once the patient was stably weaning in the NICU, they would then be transferred up to the general inpatient unit where a pediatric hospitalist, which is what I do, would take over this weaning process. And then once the medications were weaned off after a 24 hour period or so, we'd bring the family in and together try to plan about what our disposition to home plan is gonna look like. So I think I just summarized pretty much what we think of as the traditional model of care um, for NAS. My, my first question that I typically will ask the crowd, and I, you, I will encourage you guys to raise your hands uh, from wherever you are is, does this sound like what you're used to as the traditional model of care? And when I typically ask that question, I see all of the hands go up and some people shake their, shake their heads yes. The question I then follow up with is, did anybody in the crowd invent this traditional model of care? And that is typically when I see the hands go down and the, the nods turn to shaking no. And this is kind of when I try to find out if Dr. Finnegan is in the crowd. And so far I have not received a text box check in that she is listening. So I think we're in a safe place. And, and I bring this up because I did not invent this traditional model of care either. I showed up in 2007, just started doing it because I said, this is the way it's always been done. And that's kind of the, the theme that we see for the management of NAS. It's just things are done this way because they've always been done this way. And it wasn't until Dr. Grossman, uh, one of the hospitalists that I work with, started really questioning pretty much every aspect of this traditional model of care and started asking why are we doing it this way and that he started to change the way we've been doing it. And that's really the main objective of, of the talk that I have for this morning. 
um, is, is really to ask why have we been doing it this way for so long and then share some of the changes that we've been taking in our approach to the infants. And when you think about our journey and some of the results that we've been able to achieve, to achieve with the changes that we've made, so this is our control chart that we published with our quality work in 2017 in pediatrics. So every dot on this chart represents a patient that we cared for, an infant with NAS at our hospital. And on the horizontal or x-axis is time, and on the vertical or y-axis is length of stay. So if you start all the way back to the left in January of 2008, you can see our average length of stay was 22 and a half days, and that's under that traditional model of care that I just described. So that is just about at the reported national average from administrative databases. Um, and if you fast forward over an eight year period, every downward arrow with text next to it represents large scale PDSA change that we made to our approach, and we're gonna go through those. But if you get all the way to May of 2016, you can say we, we were able to achieve a reduction in our length of stay to just below six days. And, and we're excited to share that if you fast forward this to 2018 in our current practice, we've been able to sustain these results. So we still have our length of stay at just about 5.9 days. So thinking about these changes, I think David Bowie sums this up well. Hold that a fast, you love music. I think anytime you're trying to embrace a culture change, David Bowie is a good guy to turn to. And, and this is one of the key things. So this slide serves as one, an outline for the talk, but also as the really key points that you need to be able to embrace if you want to bring these changes to your institution. So the first half of the lecture focuses on non-pharmacologic care. So we think non-pharmacologic care is first-line therapy. And we believe that parents provide this level of care best by themselves when they're at the bedside. The second part to that is that medications, while they are a cornerstone in the management of neonatal abstinence, are truly second line therapy. And, and we'll, we'll go through this, but a lot of times it's because they become unnecessary if you're optimizing your first line therapy. The second half of the lecture is gonna think about how we're assessing these infants. So just like we say in all of our other pediatric disease processes, we think we need to stop treating our patients as numbers and step back and think about how they're, how functioning in the setting of withdrawal. And the, the final key point that I hope we can agree on is that 80 doses of morphine for sneezing four times instead of three times is, is extreme. So getting started, let's focus, uh, let's start off on, on thinking about all the medications you can use to, to treat NAS. So there's work done on methadone, phenobarbital, when, I, when we practiced, we were using morphine, and then we had clonidine adjuvant therapy. There's been some work published in the New England Journal recently about sublingual uh, suboxone. And really, when you look at the evidence and the canon of literature in NES, this is kind of the methodology you see. It's this battle royale methodology, pitting one pharmacologic agent against the next and trying to see which is better at reducing the length of stay, which has been the primary outcome of interest. So when you look at these studies at face value, you say, well, Let's look at tincture of opium, which I've, looked, uh, I've listed as just opium. Opium versus opium plus clonidine. Well, you see a reduction with the clonidine. But when we started to look at this, and Dr. Grossman was sharing some of these results with us, he said, let's look across the studies. And you start to see something interesting. So I'm going to pull out tincture of opium. Look at these variations that we see here. So anywhere from 17 to 79 days. We did not have, have an explanation for this. This is a homogenous patient population, presumably with NAS, all receiving the exact same medication, but you're seeing these wide variations. When you look at morphine, you see a similar, similarly large variation in, in the length of stay in the primary outcome, so it's anywhere from eight to 33 days. This, we pondered about this, and we, this was interesting. We didn't have a great explanation. We, didn't, we weren't aware of another disease process that had a similarly wide variation in, in their primary outcome. And, and we said, we, we had a theory that, you know what, maybe the medications aren't solely responsible for the outcomes given these wide variations. And lo and behold, when we turned to the AAP clinical report on neonatal drug withdrawal, we, we got some support for those claims. So I'm going to pull out some interesting and telling quotes here that I'll let you take some time to read. So drug therapy is indicated to relieve moderate to severe signs of NAS if an infant, 
if an infant does not respond to a committed program of non-pharmacologic support. Later in that section, they go on to say that withdrawal is a self-limited process. Unnecessary pharmacologic treatment will prolong drug exposure and the duration of hospitalization to the possible detriment of maternal infant bonding. We read this and said, that sounds very familiar to exactly what is happening at our hospital. Essentially what the AAP is saying is that intensive non-pharmacologic care is first line therapy and can limit unnecessary pharmacologic treatment. So this is a big flaw. None of that previous research that we talked about controlled for what is considered to be first line therapy. So that to us was com completely nuts because as a person who tries to get things published in the evidence, if I tried to take a different disease process and show a positive effect of a treatment but didn't cr control for first line therapy, that paper would not be accepted and would be thrown away. So that, that to us really was astounding when we thought about that and thinking about how to, how to uh, account for those large variations in the, in the previous research. Once we got past that whole aspect of everything, we started to turn inward and look at our own practice and say, were we offering an intensive committed non-pharmacologic support program? And at the time, the answer to that question was no. So what does a committed non-pharmacologic program look like? So this goes beyond just saying that you offer non-pharmacologic care. It is about controlling the environment, so creating a low stimulation environment, keeping it quiet, keeping the lights low. Maybe, I don't even know if it's most importantly, but equally importantly is providing feeding on demand. And this goes beyond feeding on demand as long as the demand is every three hours. We know normal newborn physiology, cluster feeding can be a normal phenomenon. Equally for NAS with hyperphagia, they may want to eat more than every three hour demand schedule. So the majority of them will not be able to adhere to that, to that uh, I keep calling it that on demand schedule, even though it is a Q3 hour schedule. We also talk about the non-pharmacologic interventions of the five S's. Bear with me, I'm gonna to try to get through these. Five S's, swaddling, swaying, shushing, sideways, and sucking. So these things have been around forever in trying to control irritability in babies with NAS as well as babies that don't have NAS. So I put this versus lasers because when you think of the research that's gone on in 2014, I wanna say in pediatrics, they published a paper looking at laser acupuncture in NAS and they, this got published and they touted the reduction in length of stay from anywhere to 50, I'm sorry, they reduced the length of stay from 50 days to 35 days using lasers, which are, I agree, they are very cool. We don't have lasers quite yet, but we do have a blanket that we wrap the babies in and we've gotten our length of stay down to 5.9 days. I think the, the, I wrote University of Michigan here because there's a story that, that we tell that really helps solidify the power of these tools and the management of these infants. One of the doctors who worked with us, Dr. Rachel Osborne, unfortunately left us, which was a sad time, but she went and moved to Michigan and is working as a hospitalist there now. On one of her first days there, she was getting a tour of the NICU. And the NICU was a pretty standard NICU at the time. It was a, a barrack style, 12 babies in a room. The bright lights were bright. Children were oscillating. Massimo machines were beeping. Oxygens were out of range. And in the corner was, uh, was a baby with a NAS who was screaming his head off, almost doing the full 360 head turn uh, and, and was kind of out of control. And the nursing staff was running around trying to find the doctor saying, what dose of medication do we give this patient? It was, it was a mayhem. And she walked over to the baby, put him in a tight swaddle, gave him a pacifier, picked him up and gently rocked him. And the baby immediately went to sleep and stopped crying. And she turned to the, the nurse and the resident and said, is this a baby you want to give morphine to? And they said, no. And who are you? And please put that baby down. So to me, I, I love telling this story because I think that was just a, a fascinating difference in the cultures that exist and the power of these tools in helping control the symptoms of NAS and allow these infants to do well. So that was Dr. Osborne, who was on a tour and really only had about five minutes to be there. And, and we started to ask, well, who is there to provide this constant care for the infants? And to us, the answer is the parents. One, two, three. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck.
Sorry, I told you I like music. I got to keep working it in there to make sure you guys are still awake. So for us, again, the answer is parents. And this is when you're starting to see the evidence coming out about rooming in and how essential that is in helping improve the care of these infants. So getting the parents to the bedside so that they can, again, provide constant and equally important immediate care and assessing of the infants. So this is having them there. They can do all those things we just talked about. They can control the environment. They can look for the signs of, of when an infant may want to eat. And they can provide these five S's. I, I've yet to see a family bring a laser in from home, but I guess if they wanted to, we'd, we'd have to work with them on that. Um, so this really does go beyond just putting the family into a single room and saying, good luck with everything and managing this baby. This, this really is about how you work with your staff and your team and the family in trying to harness the full power of the maternal infant bond in the management of neonatal abstinence syndrome. And for us, this is probably one of the biggest culture changes that we had to go through. So we, we had to step back and change from being the, the primary clinical providers for these babies to really stepping back and changing our role and becoming more coaches, cheerleaders and support staff working with these families, trying to coach them up, educate them on the best things that they can do to help care for their infants and get them through the withdrawal process. So going through the five S's, teaching on uh, the signs to look for hunger and how to, how to appropriately feed and, and do all those things that we, that we do with all of our other patients as well. So this was a big culture change for a lot of us. And I think when we started, and, and some of you may be having these thoughts even now, is this is these parents, uh, they can't do this, or maybe they don't deserve to do this. I mean, if you're having these thoughts, these are some of the biases on our side that we need to, to overcome in order to provide and embrace these changes. And I'm here to tell you, as far as in getting, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you. I, I'm here to tell you, I've seen it firsthand, and these parents can do it, and they they do it amazingly well and do it better than, than we, I believe we had done previously. So I think changing our role and overcoming biases was a big part of the culture change that we had to get through. It's not just on our side as well. There, there are serious stigmas on the, on the parent side to overcome. So there's qualitative work looking at how these parents and how these moms feel. And they feel like addiction is misunderstood. They have feelings of guilt. They feel judged and mistrusting of the staff. And I think if you think about this, it, it makes sense and you can see how they'd feel this way. We pulled out this quote, which we thought was pretty telling. So I bolded this, but I didn't want to visit. I would call before and if that nurse was there, I wouldn't even go. This is a powerful quote and you can replace nurse with doctor, resident, attending, PCA, anybody, you have to have the full staff involvement here. But this is exactly what we say is how we do not want parents to feel. So someone who just gave birth should not feel this way about going to see their own child. So this is a big part of what you need to do in order to embrace these changes. You need to overcome both provider as well as parental biases and stigmas to help deliver an empowering message and engage the family in providing this level of care for their infants. So we have totally changed our approach thinking that families are not just here to visit their infants, they are there to care for their infants. And we talk with our families and say, you are the best treatment for your child. This um, empowering message and helping get the parents on board with this is, for us, it really optimally starts in the prenatal uh, period where we have a, a social worker who has partnered with our women's center to get referrals from methadone clinics and, and meet with the families and really do prenatal counseling with them to help prepare them for the importance of their role in the postnatal period. So these families come in expecting and really knowing how important their role is going to be in caring for these infants. So once we started getting good at this, what we, what we really noticed is, you know what, those quotes I pulled out were right. The AAP is, they know what they're talking about. And a lot of times people come and say, wow, this is such a novel way of doing things. And to us, we're like, well, we just kind of read the policy report and did what the AAP already said. So the majority of what, these, what we saw, the majority of our infants were responding to now what we had was an intensive committed non-pharmacologic program. And we were seeing that the second line therapies, the medications really were becoming unnecessary in the management. I think changing culture, it's helpful when you start to feel good about what you're doing. 
And, and we really felt like as a team that we were helping strengthen the bond of these parents. I said, we had our length of stay down to 5.9 days. And in just that short period of time, we could tell these parents were more prepared to transition to home than in that traditional model of care, where after sometimes even a month in the hospital, we'd bring the families in and, and you could see that feeling of, I have no idea how to care for this infant. So five days versus 30 days, we thought we were strengthening the bond and really helping prepare these parents for success at the home. And then similar line of thinking is that we saw that this was working. We were feeling good about what we were doing and we weren't just giving uh, morphine to children who were sleeping like we talked about in the Michigan story. So once we got excited about this, the power of the maternal infant bond that we were providing on our general inpatient unit, we started to ask in which environment can we best optimize this first line therapy? And this is where we started to think about the location of, of where we offer our therapy. So the, thinking about the NICU environment versus the floor. And this is a picture on the left from our NICU actually. Um, and this is again, kind of like the one I described in Michigan. So bright lights, pretty hectic, sick children. Some of them are intubated. Um, and importantly, when you look at this environment, there is really no place for the parents to be. And they can maybe come visit, but it's not, a, not set up for success. Versus if you compare to this picture on the right, which is a stock photo taken of just a general inpatient unit, and you can see the baby is there. And what you can't see in this picture, and I probably need to update it, is the fact that in the foreground right up front is a place for the parents to, to sleep and be right at the bedside with their infant to provide that level of care that we talked about. And I think coming in on rounds in the morning, we'd probably talk about maybe we could reduce the stimulation with the lights, and we'd probably have some some room to do some anticipatory guidance on SIDS prevention and safe sleep. But that we, we get that opportunity to work with the families in that time and having them on our wards. So when we talked about which environment we can optimize care, we always make the analogy because for some reason, other disease processes, it just seems to make more sense to people. So we always say, if you had a patient with pneumonia, would you send them to a floor that did not have antibiotics? And that answer is clearly no, that would seem crazy. And we've said the same thing. Why would we send these patients to a place that cannot provide first line therapy? So for us, it was essential to try and get these patients up to our general inpatient unit where we could have the parents rooming in and be able to work with them on our empowering messages. We even started to ask why, why are we sending these kids to the NICU? And traditionally, why has this been done for so long? What is so intensive about NAS? I think the biggest concern would probably be seizures. And in the 70s, Dr. Herzlinger, who's actually a neonatologist in, our, in the Yale system, uh, published a study showing an incidence of anywhere between 2 to 11% of seizures. And when we talked to him about this study, he said, oh, yeah, I remember that. Um, we're not actually totally sure those were seizures. So that was comforting as far as how solid the evidence base is and the management of these kids. And when we published our work over a 10 year period, we, we have had zero seizures in these kids. Even beyond that, on the general inpatient unit, we treat seizures relatively frequently. So we're not sure why these kids have been going to the NICU. When you compare them to other patients who are in the NICU, you notice they're a lot bigger, they're not premature generally, and they're really not as sick. We haven't, they're not oscillating, they're not intubated, they're, they're less intensive than the other patients. And we think a lot of the reason these guys have been going to the NICU for so long is pretty much what we see in all of the management of NAS. It's really about eminence-based medicine over evidence-based medicine. And what was done yesterday has been carried forward for decades. And that traditional model, because it was done before, is now what's just been done. And we always say at our institution, when you have an eminence-based practice, that's an area that's ripe for changing and trying to improve. So that is kind of what we did. And if you get back to our control chart, which serves as the blueprint for some of the changes, you can see these are the first half of the lecture and some of the big PDSA changes that we were able to achieve. So standardizing our non-pharmacologic care, moving left to right here, working with our well baby unit to directly transfer these patients to our inpatient unit, bypassing our NICU, and then really working about how we're delivering our empowering message about the importance of the non-pharmacologic care and the parental involvement, and really having this start even prenatally with our counseling that we've developed. So moving on to some more exciting changes and getting back to uh, David Bowie. To changes, to changes, to changes. 
Okay, I, I just had to keep hearing it. I'm sorry. So thinking the second half, some some other big changes to what we've been doing. So thinking about how we're assessing these infants. So we were questioning pretty much every aspect, like I said, of the traditional model of care. So why not question the Finnegan? It's been around for since uh, the 70s, and we all know the Finnegan. I'm sure we all love the Finnegan. It, had, it shows, it catalogs literally all the symptoms of NAS you would expect. It breaks it into three systems, CNS, metabolic, gastrointestinal. You get points for various symptoms, and you tally them up, and then you get a score that helps um, provide a, a recipe of what you do for your patient. So, like I said, we're questioning everything. What were some of the problems that we thought we saw with the Finnegan? And you can see um, Chris Farley over here saying, leave the baby alone. Can we stop the insanity? So the first thing that we saw is we're literally disturbing these infants to get a Finnegan score. We are inducing symptoms of withdrawal every time we check the Finnegan. And we thought this kind of went against our first tenant of do no harm. So we always ask this question, how do you observe for an exaggerated moro? Exactly. You unwrap them and you pick them up and kind of gently drop them, as I say, and they have that exaggerated moral, which as an educator feels really nice when I want to show a medical student exaggerated moral when my confidence is low. But for the patient, we said, what was the positive effect of doing that? So we thought that seemed a little bit like a problem of the Finnegan. The second problem we talked about was that it was pretty slow to respond. So with the, the, a range of anywhere to two to four hours of checking these, sometimes you can take eight or even more hours of recording higher scores before you're able to intervene and provide some relief to this patient. The third problem we saw was, I, I, we just still don't know what the clinical significance of yawning four times versus three times. So I can't see you all, but normally when I give this talk, I can see some people yawning at various points, which is why I started to put music into it. But I always say if someone yawns, one more time, I will be giving that person morphine, which maybe will have the opposite effects, and they'll definitely fall asleep during the talk. And then the last part that we, uh, the problem we said is, why are we even using eight as the cutoff? So I asked, did anyone invent the traditional model of care? Did anyone out there in webinar land develop, decide to say eight was the number they were going to use for their cutoff? I feel like probably most of you are shaking your head no. I never would come into work and say, you know what? I thought about nine, but we'll probably just stick with eight. And if you, if you look into the evidence, this is why eight has been the number for so long. So this is from 1975, uh, Dr. Finnegan's initial work using the FNAS. So here's the quote that has basically dictated the management of these infants. So infants with a score of seven or less were not treated with drugs for the abstinence syndrome because, and this is the, the quote, in our experience, he would recover rapidly with swaddling and demand feedings. Infants whose score was eight or above were treated pharmacologically. So this is it. This is why eight has always been the number, and this is why you've been doing what you've been doing for so long. And again, to us, this represents just more eminence-based practice. This, is, this assertion has, while it's been validated to show that maybe it correlates with withdrawal, it's never really been validated to show the effect on management and to us represented, again, another area of eminence-based practice, which we said typically and generally are, are ripe for changes. So when we got our team together and in our own experience, when we said what we really care about for any baby, regardless if they have NAS, is can they eat, can they sleep, and can they be consoled? Essentially, can they function like we would expect of any baby? So we don't have... Um, a fancy scoring tool. We don't typically like to do math, even though it's just addition. So every morning when we, when we come together as a team on family center grounds and we round in the room with the families, the patient, the residents, intern, med students, we have some pharmacy members, the attending, nursing staff. When we get in there, we, we talk about how the baby's doing in the setting. And this is something we do continuously throughout the day. So we say, can this baby eat? And when we set our, our parameters, we said, can they take minimum of an ounce if they're doing formula, or can they breastfeed effectively? Can this baby sleep? We said, can they get uninterrupted sleep for at least an hour in between feeding? And then can this baby be consoled? So when we talked about it in our, our ethical agreement, we said, can, can we use our non-pharmacologic interventions to console this patient within 10 minutes? 
And if the answer to these things were yes, we thought the patient was being well managed using our first line therapy, regardless of what the, the Finnegan score says or how many symptoms of withdrawal the patient had. So we actually did a study um, that it was just published in Hospital Pediatrics um, that looked at the effect of using this uh, assessment tool. So using this ESC or the Eat Sleep Console methodology. So we looked at 50 uh, babies with NAS, consecutive babies who we took care of during uh, March of 2014 to August of 2015. And during that time frame, all of our decisions about how we were going to manage these infants were, were, were based off of using the ESC. At the same time, the, the staff protocols hadn't necessarily caught up to our changes in, in management. So the Finnegan scores were still being assessed uh, in every two to six hour period, but we did not use these scores to help guide or make any management decisions. And this is what we were interested in looking at. So we were interested in looking at the proportion of infants that we actually treated with morphine using our ESC approach versus the proportion that the Finnegan would have predicted us to treat had we been using the Finnegan. We also looked at the days these two approaches disagreed, and then the effect on the Finnegan score of the day after the two approaches disagreed. And here are the results that we found. So this is a, a bar graph showing um, the proportion of infants that received morphine. So if you look on the left, during that time period, 12% of the infants received morphine using our eat, sleep, console functional assessment. And had we been using the Finnegan, that would have been upwards of 62% 62, 62 of infants would have been exposed to morphine. Now looking at the days they disagreed. So on 78 days, the ESC said, you know what, you can either, you should reduce the morphine. And the Finnegan said you should either stay the same or go up. On the following day, the average Finnegan score actually decreased by 0.9 points on days that we did not provide medication, even though the Finnegan said we should have. There were two days where the ESC said you should, we said we should give medication, so we gave medicine, whereas the Finnegan was saying you should either stay where you're at or go down. And in both of those cases, the average Finnegan score increased the following day by 1.7 points. During this time period, there were no reported adverse events, so no readmissions, no seizures, no ICU transfers, and um, the maximum average weight loss was 8%, and weight loss at discharge was decreased to 7%. So in our final assessment of what, what we ended up saying was that using the ESC, we, we successfully reduced our exposure to medication using a functional assessment, rather than like we talked about before, treating the patients as a number. So if you think about putting this into action and how we use it, I'm going to give you a couple examples of what we do. So function versus number. So let's take baby A. Baby A sneezes and yawns four times. He's hypertonic and has tremors. We would say he has um, NAS. He's showing us the signs that he clinically is with, in withdrawal. But when you look at how he's doing and functioning, he's meeting all those parameters we talked about. He's eating, he's sleeping, and he's consolable. So for us, our assessment would be first-line therapy is working, and our plan would be continue this current plan of, of optimizing non-pharmacologic interventions, and then if everything is stable, we would discharge typically around day five of life. Now, if we compare this to the traditional model of care, so baby B sneezes and yawns four times, he's hypertonic, his Finnegan is 10. He equally, just like baby A, is doing everything we would expect of a normal baby, but because his Finnegan was above 10, he's now getting treated with medications. And here's the problem with once you start a medication. Once you start it, you got to go with that slow weaning process. So at a 10% wean per day, and that's every day, not even doing every other day, you are now exposing this patient and fading him to 80 more doses of morphine and added minimum 10 days in the hospital just because of that fin Finnegan score getting above 10. So to us, this sounded... Again, we, we, we couldn't even come up with a reason for why we were doing this, and it's something that we thought we wanted to change. So here's kind of another example of, of even a different change, but how we, how we do this in, uh, in practice. So we started thinking about how we've been using our second-line therapy agents as well. So say it's 3 p.m., and I said we were using our ESC on a continuous, uh, continuous basis. So it's 3 p.m., 
baby with NAS is screaming. He's been irritable for 10 minutes. Our first question is, is there something we can do to optimize our non-pharmacologic interventions? Can we calm him? Where is mom? Can she come back? Is there a volunteer? We're lucky enough to have a, a good cadre of volunteer baby holders who are, some of them are amazing. They can take a baby with a Finnegan of 20 and get them basically completely calm. So can we get any of these things? Is there lights that can go up? Can we turn volume down to help calm the baby? And the answer to that at that time is no. So this is the time where we would give our second line therapy. And we still actually are using morphine. So this is when we would give a dose of morphine at 0.05 milligrams per kilogram times one. And we would use it as a PRN basis. And then we would move forward continuously reassessing how the patient is doing and do they require any further second line therapies. So now we fast forward, it's 5 p.m., two hours later, and the mom is back and the baby again is calm. So our assessment at that time would be first line therapy is again working. So once we say that, we do not see the need to give 80 more doses of medications. So we will not provide any further medications unless we see evidence that the patient is again failing first line therapy. So these are some of the big changes that we made and we're kind of getting back to the, the beginning of the, of, the, of the talk when we um, went through this traditional model of care, delivery rooms, NICU, using the Finnegan, starting medications really as the first line therapy and then this long weaning process. So really now what we do is bypass the NICU, delivery room directly from to well baby to our floor. We use a functional assessment. We focus our first line therapies on providing these non-pharmacologic interventions and empowering the families. And in doing so, we've really had medications move to be what we consider second line therapy. And we're using them much more often on a PRN medication, PRN basis. So when we think of uh, of some of the other results, we talked about length of stay. Um, we can show some other things we've been able to achieve with, um, with these changes to our practice. So percent of NAS patients who are treated with morphine. This is up to 2010 before we started making these changes. We were about 92% of our patients, which is a little bit higher than the national average. And if you fast forward to 2016, we're now just under 10% of our patients are receiving morphine. So this is the, the question that we like to ask everybody is what percent of infants are we treating for NAS in 2016? Great, I heard it. Even Bitsy answered it, she knows it by now. It's 100% of our patients are being treated. So they're all receiving intensive committed non-pharmacologic programs focused on rooming in and the functional assessment. And just about 10% are failing first line, not failing, but are just also requiring medications to help treat their NAS. We've also been able to show a decrease in the um, maximum morphine dose that we're exposing these infants to. And anytime you can get the parents to the bedside uh, and really work on education and work with the families, you're gonna, we've seen an increase in the breastfeeding rates who are now above 50%, which is something we're very excited and proud about. And again, anytime you can also um, shorten length of stay and decrease utilization of NICUs as well as um, medication exposures, then you're gonna confer a significant cost benefit. So I think, our cost probably peaked, it looks like in 2008, at just about $50,000 average cost per patient. And in 2015, we're down to just above 10,000, which when you crunch the numbers, comes out to about $2 million cost savings per year. And the impact on this is just at our own institution nationwide for the rising epidemic of opioid exposures in infants. This cost saving can be, I'll say very, very significant. So long and winding. So we're back to the blueprint, and we've pretty much filled in every, all of the changes that we were able to make. And I put the long and winding road, because when we started, I said this took us eight years, um, which people, again, like to ask us, how do you do this? Culture change is hard, and how, how can this be done? And for us, I don't even think we're the greatest role model. I mean, it took us a while because we were developing some of these things, but it took us eight years. And I, I gave this talk up at a, a local hospital where after I spoke, a nurse practitioner got up and spoke about her experience implementing these changes at their community hospital. And I was fascinated to watch this because she literally did everything in one night. 
And it blew my mind because I was like, you know what? I played the long and winding road because that's how things went for us. But it doesn't have to be that way. And she talked about, you know what? She heard this talk and said, this is what we're going to do. And she worked with the staff. She said the first night was a little bit rough. I'll put that lightly, but they were able to do it. And after doing it, the culture changed and people saw that it was worthwhile, worthwhile, doable, and that they also felt good about what they were doing. So we, we say, and she bought into this too, is that you need to have a very good reason if you're going to be separating the parents from the babies. So that is one of our major, our main tenants is they need to stay together. The maternal infant diet has to be together if you're going to, to, to make these changes and optimize your care of these infants. So this took us, again, I keep saying the same thing, but eight years, and it doesn't have to. Um, she did this in, in one day. And when you think about how to change culture, there's a great paradigm from quality improvement work called the lone nut. And I don't want to say her name, but she was their hospital's lone nut. Dr. Grossman was our hospital's lone nut, and I'm one of the early followers and I just want to play this video. It's about two minutes long, and then we're going to be pretty much finished and get, get on to questions. Um, but this is the way that our, our change happened and the way people have successfully been able to make changes. It really does take, take a low nut. So I'll let you guys watch this, which is one of my favorite videos. It's from a TED Talk. Let's see if this works. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now, here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out, you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. That's my favorite If the leader line. is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd oh, is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is um, how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. So I just love to see the, the scene where they all come, they're still just pouring in, trying to embrace this change. And I love that line, uh, the first follower transforms the lone nut into a leader. So again, Dr. Grossman was our lone nut, asking why are we doing it this way, thinking this was crazy, making changes, and then more and more of us started to join him and he nurtured us just like they say it pretty much follows this exact this exact paradigm for how to how to change culture and it is what what we did at our institution again it took us eight years but hearing the, the experience from the, the nurse practitioner and being there alone nut and really becoming a strong leader and getting some followers was was really uh, inspiring for me to see and hear um i think we as far as thinking about next steps of like where, where we're going with, uh, with um, research in NAS and, and thinking about is I feel like we have a very good idea of what's happening with our infants based on these changes that we've made inside the hospital. And I think we're trying to think about, even if you look at the traditional model that we talked about and described, 
Um, there, there's really just a dearth of information about what happens as far as long-term developmental and neurodevelopmental outcomes. So um, we feel very, very good about the work we're doing with these infants. And if you think about some of the, the research that exists about the effects of separating parents, I know it's, a, it's an interesting thing to talk about in our current political climate, but separating parents from infants, the negative effects of that, and we know that body of research exists, but we do need to have more, more uh, evidence to, to think about the potential long-term effects uh, of changing in practice and even the current practice and traditional model, how it's been done. Um, so that is pretty much the end of my talk. I will say thank you again for this opportunity to, to one, be on my first webinar, and two, um, just be out there to spread the word and kind of hope to further the changes that we've been able to embrace. I'm happy that my dog has continued to just sleep and be quiet. I'll leave my contact information, and I'm, I'm assuming they're going to share the slides as well, so you can have that. If there are any questions or any um, contact, I'll be happy to answer those. And we can take some time for questions. I'm going to put up some sources on the next slide, and hopefully I can answer them. If I can't, again, email me, and we can uh, try to work out an answer to some of them. So thank you again. Appreciate your attention, and hope you enjoyed the talk. Well, uh, you know, Adam, thank you and Bitsy so much for your amazing presentation. That was awesome. And Thanks for following that lone nut. I mean, that was, <laughs> that was a great analogy. And <clears throat> I think it does really, you know, follow the change process and says it all. So um, we have a lot of questions already. <laughs> yeah. Remind people that um, please ask your question in the Q&A, not the chat. So we have all the questions together. And I have Kathy Randall here with us. And she is going to uh, field the questions and ask Dr. Berkwood, who will then do his best to answer. Absolutely. I mean, there are, this is like so many questions I've been trying to scroll through. You guys are doing awesome asking these. Um, there's, off, there's kind of a common one that's coming through. And what if, the, what if there's the mom who's incarcerated or what if the mom, you know, and parental rights have been severed up front? You know, what are some of the workarounds with that that you yeah. guys have experienced? No, yes. Um, to be honest, I think every every institution is going to have different barriers, and we, we have that sometimes, but we don't have that that often. Um, when we do have something like that, it just to, we have the other saying is it takes a what is that common saying? We basically just all pitch in and try to work with the infant. Like I said, we have a very strong volunteer a group of people who um, will come in and try to help optimize these non-pharmacologic interventions. But for us too, it almost supports how important it is having the parent there because when that happens, it's really just, I'll just say it's just not as good. Um, but I think we go out of our way. Sometimes I come into the workroom after a night shift and one of the, the lights will be off and one of the interns will be literally holding one of our NAS babies. So it does take a, a village to kind of sometimes take over for the power to replace that powerful impact that the parents can have when they're at the bedside. And when working with our DCF, which is what we call our Children for Child Protection in Connecticut, um, we work to really, if someone has had rights removed, we work to try and get the foster family in as quick as possible because we know we need someone at the bedside as soon as we can to help in the care of these infants. That's great. Thanks. I know it's super complicated with some families, but I think maybe, I think oftentimes we kind of remember those more complex cases and forget the more simple day to day. I agree. I, I think one thing maybe I'll ask with Dr. Grossman too, when he gets back is think about providing some of that evidence, even how yeah. often things would be interesting for us to look at. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was just one question about kind of clarifying on your roadmap. Um, you discussed the labor and delivery to well baby, and they wanted to confirm well baby, what meant well baby, or is it a certain um, subset of, of rooms that you have in your peds for? I think that's what the question was asking. So in our hospital, our well baby is kind of like um, the maternal unit after birth. So they're there for two days for vaginal deliveries or four days for C-sections. Um, and typically uh, what will happen is that they'll be monitored using um, using our assessment tools. And then if they're starting to look like they're going to need a medication, they will transfer them directly down to our, to our floor. But what we've really been seeing is that they've been holding on to these patients because they've also seen the power of the infant maternal bond and caring for these infants. So a lot of times what we're seeing is once the parents are discharged from the well baby nursery, they're being transferred as a, as a dyad down to our, down to our unit. Um, I don't know if that does that answer the, the yeah question? what when you say your unit what does that what did that mean 
So I'm sorry. So are you, so we work on just the general inpatient pediatric unit. It's a little different, you know, they just have re redid our entire NICU so that every room is pretty much a single. Um, but there are some, some rooms that can have shared dads, but for us, all the work that we've been doing and thinking about how we're working with the families is something that, um, we want to get them down to just the general inpatient pediatric unit, um, where we, we feel like we have more expertise at dealing with that. And we, and we don't think it's right. as intensive of a care need, um, for infants that may be actually more, more sick or require an elevated intensive care level. Awesome. So, um, there's about three or four questions around breastfeeding, you know, do you allow all of them to breastfeed? What if the mom presents with a, you know, urine drug screen that's positive? What if they're poly drug using? How do you manage all of the complexities, complexities of those kinds of um, situations? So we, we have our own institutional policy statement on the, on the role of breastfeeding. There is some, a little bit of controversy around the role of marijuana in it. Um, but I think the big thing is trying to work on getting something that is consistent across floors, especially because nothing drives people crazier than hearing one thing and then having it change. So we do have a policy statement that um, co co urine tox is, is a contraindication in some circumstances, and we work with social work and our uh, child protection services to kind of determine um, the feasibility of using breast milk. And we also will, if breast milk is cleared for methadone only, and people who have good follow up, we do have a lot of information about the families. Um, we will definitely allow breastfeeding and we'll work with our lactation consultants. Um, some parents, while we're working it out, will kind of pump and, and store uh, milk and we'll, we'll encourage that as well. Awesome. Um, what is your discharge criteria? So what makes some of the babies day five versus four versus three versus two? I feel I'm going to make something sound like... I'm making a joke, but I feel like it's whatever you're feeling like on any given day. We said there's like limited evidence. When you look at these AAP policy statements, they literally say anywhere between four to seven days is reasonable. These are non-evidence-based statements that I think we use our own clinical judgment. I, I kind of balance it based on the parent, how they're doing, managing the infant. And I think for us, we get a lot of information about what their uh, chances for success will be at home since we've had them on the floor together. I, I, I use that in my judgment, but just standard discharge criteria. Are they tolerating nutrition? Has the weight loss been too substantial? Um, sometimes I will send the patient home who may be losing a little bit of weight, but is taking great PO because I expect them to gain weight. And we've been doing work with fortifying formulas earlier on, getting up to 22 or 24 calorie formula. So tolerating nutrition, able to be consoled and able to care for the infant, um, weight gain, having a safe discharge plan. And, and somewhere typically this, this work takes four to seven days. I think there's some work with our suboxone exposed infants that maybe they have a little bit of a less severe withdrawal syndrome. So we kind of leave it open to see, um, to tailor it based on the, the clinical circumstances of how the infant's doing and the parents. Fantastic. Um, I think this is nice, a nice segue with that. So have you integrated formal community resources in the, that discharge plan? So when you talk about that solid discharge, how have, how have you closed that gap between community resources and the family inpatient? So I think for us as a hospitalist, we have to want to assure we have a community pediatrician who's going to be the primary provider. We've been setting up discharges um, to actually be followed in our NICU grad clinic which all I know is that it does not stand for graduation from the NICU, but it has, a, has a, it is like a developmental and where they follow their patients. So we've been setting up appointments with them. First time mothers in our area have a program called Nurturing Families, which is um, a, a home visiting nurse will come out and provide support to families. We've also looked to try to set up a home VNA weight checks as well. Um, and then birth to three recommendations, which is our state run, um, developmental in in-house developmental assessment um, and, and then sometimes our department of Ch uh, DCF uh, is involved in a fair amount of these cases and they may offer extra supports along with our social work as they're available but there is some like we talked about the dearth of long-term developmental in information there's work at from the mother study where they showed that the kids actually did relatively well and these children were followed closely uh, and had lots of supports for the families. So we do think there's probably even more that we could do 
um, with that. And that's something that we're looking into. Awesome. Um, I'm going to pick one of these other kind of, um, it's kind of switch gears back to the treatment. Um, so maybe I'll do these two together. Um, one is the recommended length of stay for babies at risk for withdrawal. And then when you do find that babies need the morphine, are they monitored? How, you know, people are asking a lot about that. Do they go back to the NICU if they start needing those meds? You know, any incidents that you want to share or any best practices around the morphine use if you need it? Again, the recommended length of stay, they do say anywhere from four to seven days. There is, um, there is some uh, concern for possible late onset of withdrawal with methadone or the medications that have longer half-lives like methadone and suboxone. Um, but it's a pretty rare event and we kind of get a sense of how, again, how the infant's doing. If they're exposed to short acting opiates, I think there's a chance you could even send them home around day three if everything is going well and you have a family that is uh, well established and known. So, I mean, I think there's room again within that to, to come up with what you guys think is, is, reasonable as a clinical provider. Um, if we need to give a PRN medications on our general inpatient unit, we can do it. Um, we currently have a rule on our well baby unit where they're uncomfortable giving morphine. And as opposed to just like saying this is acceptable and moving on, we're kind of working with them to end pharmacy and trying to say, well, we should be able to give this on well baby. There's really like just the whole theme of the talk. There's no reason why we can't do this and we when we give a morphine on the floors we i believe we we do put them on a monitor but there is some work currently underway i believe that's looking at the safety of not even having these children on monitors it's not like you're giving them opioid therapy you're just providing them opioids back to their kind of general their general steady state so we do think it's safe to give morphine and um at this point we're still kind of working on on that but we do um we do monitor them, but in the future, we may not. And they, we do not transfer them back to the NICU on our floor. We've been able to, to keep them. Awesome. And then um, after that single dose, uh, do you have I any? Think, can I say one thing? Yeah, and sure. I'll, I'll just say that we, we literally, our main tenant, like I said, is we need to keep the maternal infant dyad intact. So that is kind of what guides all of the decisions we're trying to do. So the fact of getting well baby to provide morphine would be in an effort to keep the parents together. We would not send them to the NICU because that would go against what our main tenant would be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and then just there was a follow up to that of, you know, is there any minimum amount of time you observe them after that single one time dose? Right. Uh, I mean, that is a little, yeah, we typically will do a 24 hour period, not requiring any further um, second line therapies. Okay, cool. Um, I'm just kind of trying to scroll through these. You guys are asking so many questions so quickly. Um, there have been several questions just about staff culture and how do you get through some of these long held beliefs and biases and you know, what strategies have worked well for you or for even other units that have, you know, coordinated with you or consulted with you or emailed with you? What things can you share that have been most valuable for just helping get through those barriers? I think a lot of it is like the proof is in, in what you see. And it really does. I, I played that lone nut video because that is like the answer that we give people. Um, it is really about making the change. And just like I said with that practitioner who, um, who gave her talk about initiating it, she said the first night was rough, but she was there at the bedside with the parents, with the staff, saying this is the right thing to do. They felt very strongly about that. So that is kind of what drives it and, make, and wanting to make this change because you think it's really the right thing to do. Um, and then I think you got to just keep working with, working with the staff and hopefully they, they come around and start to see it. That's kind of what happened at our, at our institution. They, it was pretty obvious. We felt good about what we were doing. That's awesome. Um, it's a hard question to answer, but that is, is literally the, that's, that's the model. We always say, like, if you want to separate these parents, you better have, I don't even know what the reason would be. It makes no sense. But there are significant biases that you need to overcome. Um, yeah. And then it is about doing the lone nut and, and being a strong leader and wanting to make this change. Yeah, I, there are a few people who have posted just about kind of some of the restrictions of their policies. You know, they're working inpatient residentials. Um, doesn't allow mom to stay more than an hour. So I think that kind of speaks to, 
to some of those pieces of, you know, you have to take where you are, look where you want to go, be that lone nut, be that strong leader. And yeah. And I, I think a lot of these policies, I mean, we have policies in place too, that we end up changing because they're counterproductive to what we think of as better for our patients. Um, and um, I do know that there are some places like in some community hospitals have some physical restraints that they only can go to a NICU. But I do think I would encourage people to try to come up with creative responses to how can you basically make sure you try to keep that maternal infant diet intact and how beyond that, even at our place now that they have, like I said, our NICU is a single bed. We still would try to not send them there because the work that we do and how we provide anticipatory guidance and work with the families and the, our team that we've created is, uh, we think is kind of a better place for them to be is with us. But if you can't do that, then I would try to work on getting creative about how you can get the parents to the bedside and then change the way you're working with them. Absolutely. Um, there's been a couple questions around feeding, um, feeding needs, maybe using some of our OT colleagues in um, consults and treatments. Um, kind of what's been your practice and your observations around feeding difficulties and, um, and how, do you, how do you work around that for those kiddos? We will get um, OT consults on these patients. That's a group that they said they will see. So we, we do get OT consults on them. We have nutrition as well who will come in. But we've been supplementing earlier on with 22-calorie formula, I want to say. Um, and uh, a lot, sometimes we will end up using um, NG tubes as well to supplement them. I always said sometimes we were giving morphine for a child who wasn't eating, but they were just so sleepy that they weren't eating. So to us, that didn't seem like a child who needed medication to be treated. They just needed nutritional, uh, nutritional supplementation until they kind of came around. But for us, we're seeing a lot of these infants are doing well. Um, and there is some degree of discoordination with feeding, but there's also a degree of hyperphagia where they almost want to eat. And we do find that it helps soothe them. Awesome. Um, and then there was a question around um, just complementary um, therapies and using massage touch hydrotherapy what what has been your hospital's take on that um we're all for complementary alternative therapies so for us like what we've seen is the five s's and just being there and having the parents even skin to skin time with families has been enough to help control these infants and creating controlling the environment i know there's work on reiki aromatherapy i think is underway um massage and touch. I think all of those are showing potential benefits. So I, I'm, I'm all for things that we think are going to improve the care of these infants. Awesome. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to answer and scroll and read and listen. Um, people are asking about whether or not the recording will be available. It will be available. If you registered, you'll get the link for that once it's posted. Um, and they're asking, um, Diana, you're asking about permission to use parts of this. I think I would just contact Dr. Um, Berkwit directly and, and chat about your needs for that. And I think too, like I'm happy that they'll share this because I think a big part of the change is pointing out some of these crazy things that we're doing to staff and even thinking about using the Finnegan, like asking why are, why are we doing this? And that's, and people can't really answer it. Or why are you separating? Why are we separating? And there's not gonna be an answer that makes sense. Right. So I, I think these are, I think, ripe, eminence-based practices, ripe for change. <laughs> ripe for change. Will you review the five S's again? There was a question about that. Oh, um, swaddling, sucking, swaying. So sucking is the pacifier. Swaying is the gentle rocking. Swaddling, I've definitely improved my swaddling skills. Swaddling, swaying, sucking sideways is how you hold them. Um, and then the shushing to kind of mimic the sound of vena cable blood flow that they're used to from being in the womb. So the shh. Awesome. There yeah. were a couple questions around swaddling. Are you just using regular blankets? Do you find that to be effective? Yes, that's, that's what we use. But I'm trying to remember there was, a, I was up at some place where they talked about a different swaddling technique that we have not employed at our, our institution, but it's really just yet yeah, swaddling. And there are some, I'm not quite at master swaddle level. There are some, some staff <laughs> members in our hospital who I, I can't even like unwrap them. I have like a hard time. So I think, um, yeah, a tight so, swaddle can be very effective. A yeah, tight swaddle, yeah. Yeah, they do like that just pressure, I think, sometimes. Um, yep. What about for iatrogenic exposures? We're talking about maternal exposures and that withdrawal. What about the... Um, 
inpatient, just a atrogenic sick baby who's now withdrawing? How have you, has anyone looked at that? Or do you, do you know if your NICU is employing any of that? No, um, I'm, I'm not hundred percent positive. We do get a lot of patients transferred to us for withdrawal from the um, intensive care unit. Some of them are older in general. What we've been doing is just kind of going a little bit quicker with all our withdrawal process. Um, and just basically assessing how the patients are doing and seeing what they need and not just falling into like, this has to be done this certain way. Awesome. Oh my gosh, there's so many. There's a couple questions on staffing, which I'm, you know, like if, is it a three to one or a four to one and, and what your standards are? I don't know if you can answer that or if you know. Um, I think we're mainly a four to one institution. I do think that, um, once you get this in place, like these patients, it's a lot, some of the families can, I understand they can seem a little difficult to work with, but they end up doing the majority of the care. I don't want to minimize the work of the staff, but I think that is kind of the take of them, that they've actually become a little bit easier for us to manage because the, the families and the, the people at the beds that are really doing the work for the, for the children. And then do you have a, do you have a standardized help. pathway or education packet you give your families? So how yeah, do you have, get that buy-in and when does it start? So the prenatal visiting, they do have packets of, of information. I want to say um, uh, we are currently working on our pathway. In the beginning, you mentioned I'm the head of the clinical pathway development. So I'm a little bit overwhelmed with all the pathways that we're trying to develop, but this is definitely one of them. Um, and we do have a, a protocol in place, but we're trying to put a pathway together that's a little more streamlined. Cool. And then I just wanted to clarify, someone asked, um, about the morphine doses. So those are single one-time doses. You don't give, if a baby doesn't meet the criteria and you give a one-time, there's no taper from that one-time dose. It's a single dose, low dose, and then you might dose again. And how do yep. you, can you integrate that? That's pretty much what we do. So we, we will dose once and then look for the effect. If we think that dose was low enough, we'll go up by um, 0 0.02 milligrams per kilogram until we can kind of get the patient to where we think that they meet our functional assessment. And then we'll use that dose to treat them on a PRN basis. I recently had to do that on a patient and we ended up using, once we found the right dose, we ended up using like two more doses and then the patient went home around day six or seven, I want to say. Perfect. I mean, think of the, the methadone exposure, the peak, the onset to withdrawal is somewhere 36 to 48 hours, I want to say. And then um, hopefully over time, the numbers start to get, the withdrawal process starts to improve. And we've had some, I'll just keep talking at this yes. point. <laughs> okay, you know, go for it. We had Dr. Grossman was telling me about a family who called him at two weeks and was saying, you know, our baby is still having some of these signs and symptoms. And they, they were, they just wanted to know if that was normal, which it can mm -hmm. be. They were like, we don't want to come back to the hospital. We're totally managing it and the child's doing well. We just want to make sure this was still within the realm of normal. And he said, yes, that can happen. But it seemed like they were doing well in helping manage, it, manage the symptoms. And the child is still functioning well. Yeah, yeah. Um, some of this is just um, more questions about, um, you know, skin care. You know, these babies oftentimes do have um, runny rash. stools and rash. Any, any best practices you want to share there? I, I'm, I'm not I mean, we, I think our nursing staff, are, they're, like I said, swaddling experts, but also butt rash experts. And I think we're <laughs> yeah. specifically using just like a thick application of barrier creams. I think we have butt paste in the hospital. We tend to not use Ilex as much, but um, mm -hmm. I do know that they're uh, on the host I'm on a hospital's listserv that people were sending around a, um, a concoction that they thought was working very well. I haven't seen anything in the literature, but maybe something will be coming out on that. And I don't know if there's a source even via this website where people can share formulations that they think may be effective. Yeah, through. maybe through the um, different Facebook groups and stuff, for sure. Yeah, if I search my email, I might be able to find the list, or the, but I think that might take too much time right now. No, that's okay. Uh, let's see, gosh, um, do you use any PRNs for gas pains, things like that for managing? No. no. Just swaddle and rock and soothe and sush and... Yep. All of that. Um, people are asking to go back a slide to your email address. So they are, I have a feeling 
you may be sorry. You're going to get a lot of questions. I'll try my best to answer them. I have a lot of, if I don't write back immediately, I will get to it. I promise. Yes. Yes. I can attest to that. Uh, um, uh, yeah, that I'm late in getting no, back. No, that you <laughs> do respond. You do respond. He's <laughs> good at email. Sorry, I have um, weeks where I do the service time too, which starts to get, builds up. Oh, they're telling me that I, you must have added this slide after you, um, after we chatted, because I don't, I didn't include your email address. So we'll be sure to put it on the resource page as well, on the, where people can get the recording. We'll just put a little place there with your email address. Thanks guys for letting me know about that. Um, there's some questions that I think might be really specific to certain hospitals, like where moms are getting their meds, you know, does a mom, a mom who stays inpatient with the baby and peds do who pays for that. But it sounds like the moms are being discharged from maternity and then they're just with their baby in the yes. peds unit. The majority of our infants are Medicaid um, patients and that that's, yep. And I think, yeah, if anything, our length of stay, I, I just may be getting beyond my, my level of understanding since we don't get much training on finances of medicine, but it seems like Medicaid pays in block payments for various diagnoses. And if anything, this cost reduction, I think um, just saves money for the hospital. I feel like I'm not positive. Good topic for another lecture. No, yeah. It's a good one. Yeah, for sure. So there are some questions around just ongoing physician training. So, you know, most, many people work in, teaching institutions and residents come and residents go and um, how have you found it to be successful? I mean, in your unit, this is just what you do, right? Quote unquote, it's just what you do now. So people are learning it as they're practicing, but do you do anything formal to kind of talk about the his historical so that then when they do end up in another place after they leave their training program, that they're not like shocked by other yes. practices. We actually have residents calling us from when they get to their, their place of if they're doing a fellowship or they're like, so um, yeah, they've seen, and they, they are trying to do some of the same stuff that we've been doing. But for our current ones, it's, this is just, they don't know any other way. This is the way we do it. Um, and they, they see that it works. We do talk with them though. I mean, I, I teach on rounds. So a lot of times with the families, we'll also talk about the historical perspectives. And some of our, our patients have been through the old way and um, they're like, oh, yeah, this way is completely, completely better. And they thank you. So while the residents may not know that, they, um, they hear it from the patients firsthand. Awesome. And then just one final time, can you remind everyone where your paper was published just recently? Um, so there's one in hospital pediatrics. And we wrote, um, doc, so Dr. Grossman, um, Matthew Grossman, G-R-O-S-S-M-A-N is the first author on these papers. And there's a quality improvement paper in 2017 from pediatrics. And there's a commentary in hospital pediatrics, as well as the one talking about our ESC approach. Awesome. Well, I think we'll wrap it there. I think we've pretty much hit them all and I appreciate you being willing to stay over. Yeah, no problem. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm excited. Again, this is uh, what we like to do as far as trying to spread the word. So we hope you guys are successful in implementing these changes. We think it's worthwhile. Well, again, you know, thank you so much. Um, this webinar was brought to you by Dandelion Medical, and we are thrilled to have experts like Dr. Berkwit as part of our webinar series. Um, for those of you that have stuck around to receive your free CE, um, as well as listen to all the answers to the questions, um, you will need to fill out the webinar evaluation. Check right now in the chat area and you can click on the evaluation link. If you are watching the recording, please go back to the email you received with the link to the recording and click on the link to the evaluation form. You will receive an email with a PDF of your CE certificate within 24 hours um, of, watch, of uh, filling that out. If you're watching live and you don't have time to fill out the evaluation right now or your hospital is blocked access, you'll receive an email within a day or two with a link to the recording as well as a link to the evaluation. So lots of people have been asking about the recording link. Um, you will get that in an email from me. And if you're viewing as a group, you must each log on to the evaluation form to get the CE. So you've got to fill it out individually. Um, we do hope you'll like Dandelion Medical on LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, I'm excited to say that several of the things that Dr. Berkwood talked about Dandelion Medical can help with. Um, I am going to send you, Dr. Berkwood, some of our Dandel Wrap Stretch 
uh, product. Someone did mention that in a comment. Um, we have a great swaddle that is breathable and wickable and the baby can actually move a little bit in it and we found it's been great for NAS babies. We also have an organic butt balm that is uh, wonderful with um, you know, any kind of a, a diaper rash problem, um, both post and pre and post diaper rash. Um, we have a dandelion tub that a lot of the, especially the smaller babies just love to be swaddled and bathed. So mm -hmm. um, there's a place on the evaluation that you guys can check that off if you're interested in getting any of those samples. So we, we hope you'll uh, continue to watch and look for dandelion medical webinars. We're excited to be able to offer cutting edge information like this. And thank you all for your participation. This was a record number of people that have ever uh, participated live in any of our webinars in the past. So hot and, one, and one dog too. And one dog, Bitsy, we're so thank glad you. that you could join us. Another <laughs> record. <Thank you. laughs> Thanks again, everyone, and have a great rest of your week. Thank you.